Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I can see that the participants are starting to arrive. Then we will wait a few seconds because the numbers are growing very fast. Yeah, 30 participants. Then, uh, meanwhile, the people is, is entering in the meeting room. <laughs> I will introduce myself. Uh, my name is Sarah Bazard. I was uh, chair of this cost action call at Indus that ends uh, this October, but thanks to the collaboration with WMO, DAS uh, the Barcelona DAS Regional Center of the SDS was program, uh, we, we are keeping this activity for, for longer periods than since now the webinars, uh, since October, sorry, the webinars has a frequency of one every month. And uh, with me today, it is in the panelists, Estelle Escajatriz, that it was involved in the cost action of, uh, as a leader of the dissemination and capacity building strategies, and Ernest Werner, that is the technical director of the WMO Barcelona Dash Regional Center. And uh, today I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Estelios as a chair of this webinar, and he will introduce our speaker of today. And thanks a lot for being here today. Okay, thank you very much, Sarah, and thank you very much, everybody, for being uh, again this uh, this week here in the in dust uh, now. Barcelona uh, Supercomputing Center related seminars. And uh, we have the pleasure today to host Alexander Hefele, uh, that is going to speak about the e-profile network for vertical profile of wind clouds and aerosols. Uh, Alexander is working in Medio Suite. He studied in the University of Bern, and his PhD was also in Bern on measurements of the atmospheric, stratospheric, and atmospheric water vapor with ground-based microwave spectral radiometry. And uh, he uh, works a lot with the e-profile network. He's a part of this uh, uh, last funding from UMETNET uh, project uh, uh, e-profile. And uh, his basic uh, uh, research is uh, uh, on the development and optimization of retrieval methods from passive and active remote sensing, and also the development of surface-based remote sensing technologies and applications. Uh, he's uh, manager of the operational service of Figure Files since 2013. Uh, he's also an adjunct professor in the University of Western Ontario. And from 2018, is the head of the upper division in Metro Suisse. So, Alexander, uh, the floor is yours. And thank you very much for being here with us. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Stelios. And also, thank you, Sarah, for inviting me today and giving me the opportunity to present e-profile in, um, in this framework. So there was already once a presentation of e-profile in, uh, in the industry community, and I tried also to uh, not to have too much overlap with this previous presentation back then given by Maxim Hervo, um, even though you might have forgotten already a few things. Um, so. Uh, that would then also be the occasion to, to give a reminder here. So I would first like to acknowledge my, my co-authors here um, from the e-profile team, Rolf Rufenacht, Simon Bircher, Miles Turp, Volker Lehmann, Ina Mattis, Nico Gimini, and Augustin Mortier. But I would also really like to acknowledge the whole e-profile community, as well as the cost 2 prof community and the actress community. It's really important to underline that what I'm going to present is, um, is, is really a group effort and obviously the scientific basis for most of these activities and, and results that I'm going to show are based on these, um, uh, on these quite large communities. So the outline of the talk, I will briefly introduce UMetNet and eProfile and then describe automatic LIDARs and silometers, which we refer to as ALCs, then talk about the calibration, the monitoring and the validation of the data that we produce, uh, show how you can access the data, um, 
illustrate the use of the data with um, a short case study and then also give an outlook of what we are currently working on, what the new products will be from eProfile, and we'll wrap up with a summary in the conclusion. So UMETnet is the grouping of the European Metrological and Hydro Hydrological Services. It has 31 members and it, it fosters cooperation and also it's a platform or a possibility for the members to, to share costs when operating the observing system. The main domains uh, cover observations, the most important part probably, but also forecasting and climate aviation and research and development. And here on this sketch, uh, you can see the most important components of the observation domain of UMETnet. Uh, these are aircraft-based observation uh, buoys, where there are drifting buoys that are just floating in the in the oceans or moored buoys that are uh, fixed to the ground. There are balloon soundings from ships. So these are all a bit exotic measurements, but they are very important for the operational um, metrology in particular for numerical weather prediction. And then on the land, you have the radar network that you might know under the name of, of OPERA and then the wind profiler and LIDAR and silometer network, that's e-profile. And um, these are the, the ground observations. So we are, we are here. E-profile is a component of the observation capability area, area of UMETnet. And that's what I'm going to present in more detail today. Um, E-profile coordinates three networks. One network is dedicated to upper air winds, so vertical profiles of wind, and it includes roughly 40 wind profilers or radar wind profilers, uh, almost 100 weather radars that produce wind profiles uh, when there's precipitation. And we are also starting next year to integrate Doppler LIDARs. And from these instruments, we produce quite extensive set of vertical profiles of wind. Here you see illustration of these, um, of these radars, the weather radars and the wind profilers here. Then there's the ash, aerosol and cloud network. And that will be the focus of today's talk. We currently have somewhat more than 380 systems, automatic LIDARs and silometers, ALCs. And the objective is to detect uh, volcanic ash, but also other aerosols and clouds. And here again, an illustration of these kind of, of instruments. And the new component, the new addition to eProfile is um, the network for boundary layer temperature profiles and humidity. That's what we are currently implementing. And this is done with uh, K and V band microwave radiometers and we are uh, rolling out the first pilot network by the end of next year. And this should be operational by the end of 2023. And here again, an illustration of these, uh, of these instruments. So we'll briefly introduce first the wind and the temperature and humidity network, and then extensively the aerosol network. So that's an overview of this of this wind network. We have here in blue these uh, roughly 100 weather radars that produce winds when there's precipitation. These are the weather radars that the primary product is precipitation, uh, quantitative uh, precipitation estimates, but secondary product is wind. And then here in red, we have the 40 or uh, 30 wind profilers uh, all scattered over um, central part of Europe, and in green you see the Doppler LIDARs that will soon be integrated. We also um, have integrated networks outside of Europe, like the Australian network or the Canadian network, and this is part of our mission to promote uh, wind profilers and wind data from wind profilers for numerical weather prediction. And that's just an illustration of such a a measurement, what a wind profiler typically does. So 
uh, you see here as a function of the time and the altitude, wind speed and wind direction with this uh, displayed with these wind barbs here. Of course, remote sensing offers the possibility to acquire wind profiles in a continuous manner as opposed to the radio sounds, which are launched typically twice a day. And that's why this technology is, is very complementary, uh, for instance, to the radio sound network. And then for temperature and humidity, we work with these microwave radiometers. And um, the red dots here, that's the potential future network that will be operational by the end of 2023. And the light blue dots are other instruments that we have identified that we might integrate in a, in a next phase of the program. And microwave radiometers, they have um, two primary products or data levels, let's say. So there's the level one. These are the brightness temperatures. That's the primary measurement of a microwave radiometer. Here you see it for the, um, for the K-band. Um, you have different elevation angles uh, here displayed in the different colors. And you have uh, a couple of frequencies. And then you have the brightness temperature as a function of elevation angle and frequency. So that's the primary information. That's also the information that we recommend to assimilate, for instance, in numerical weather prediction models. But it requires a, a complex forward operator. And then by means of a retrieval algorithm, you can produce level two data, which are temperature profiles, integrated water vapor, and integrated liquid water. And here's just an example of a temperature measurement from a microwave radiometer. Again, you see as a function of the time and the altitude, you see the temperature here in colors and it overlaid here is also the numerical weather prediction model just as, um, as a comparison. <clears throat> so now uh, let's come to the, um, to the aerosol and cloud network. Um, here we have currently almost 400 units that are integrated and they consist of automatic LIDARs, like this instrument here, and silometers, like these two instruments here. So just briefly, how I um, want to introduce here the, the LIDAR principle. So um, a silometer, you can consider a very simple or low cost LIDAR. It's always the LIDAR principle that applies. So a LIDAR has a light source, typically a laser, and that is emitted into the atmosphere. And then when you have an aerosol layer, for instance, uh, you have part of the light that is backscattered and uh, collected and detected by a receiver. Or you can have clouds that produce even more, a backscatter even more light uh, back into the receiver. So that's very briefly, the LIDAR principle. And what we get out from this LIDAR is a profile of a parameter that we call attenuated backscatter coefficient. And you can see here uh, just a hand-drawn profile of this situation here. You see where you have the aerosols, you have slightly more uh, attenuated backscatter. And then when you hit the cloud, you have a very strong peak in attenuated backscatter. So, and it's this attenuated backscatter that is a, an optical property of the volume that we observe. And if there's aerosol or clouds present, um, aerosols and clouds are then the primary driver or contributor to this backscatter coefficient. It's important to distinguish between three categories of, of instruments that compose the e-profile network. So we have the automatic LIDARs, like this uh, mini pulse LIDAR here. These are um, very powerful LIDARs that have a very high signal to noise ratio. And the main purpose of automatic LIDARs is the detection of aerosols. Then we have what we call high signal to noise ratio oscillometers. These are oscillometers whose primary purpose is to detect the cloud base. And the aerosol is actually a secondary product, but they are sufficiently powerful 
and sensitive to have a good signal to noise ratio to detect aerosols. And then we have a third category, and these are the low signal to noise um, ratio oscillometers. These are relatively weak um, instruments where we do typically not have a very good contrast to see aerosols. Or in said in other words, we need quite a, a, a large aerosol load to actually be able to detect the aerosol. And <clears throat> so we have three different performance categories and it's important to highlight this for the rest of the presentation. So that's an illustration of this performance difference. You, you see here um, three time height cross sections. It's the identical uh, situation, once seen by an automatic LIDAR, once by a high signal to noise ratio and once by a low signal to noise ratio. And you can quickly see the differences. We have a very good contrast with the automatic LIDAR, a lot of details, um, even when there's uh, little aerosol present. We still have quite good um, contrast with the high signal to noise uh, oscillometer. Also in altitude, for instance, this layer up here, uh, it's also it's also seen, but you can see that during the day we have already significant increase in uh, in noise background from the solar background, and then if we look at the low signal to noise ratio oscillometer, uh, we are essentially limited to the um, to the parts where we have a lot of aerosol present. So this is typically in the boundary layer, and above, uh, for instance, this aerosol layer here in the free troposphere shows up only with a few with a few points. In e-profile, we have only a handful of automatic LIDARs. Roughly one third of the instruments are high signal to noise oscillometers and two third of the uh, network are low signal to noise oscillometers. Uh, maybe it's important to also mention here that we actually build on existing infrastructure. So ePROFILE is not installing and, and uh, installing instruments. We are only integrating data from existing instruments. And that's why we also have a lot of these low signal to noise oscillometers because they are quite, um, quite abundant um, across Europe. So the primary product that we produce with the oscillometer network of ePROFILE is the attenuated backscatter coefficient, which is the product of the backscatter coefficient and the two-way transmission between the LIDAR and the observed volume. So this is this formula here. And it's important to notice that the attenuated backscatter depends on the geometry. So it depends where the LIDAR is situated because it includes the two-way transmission between the instrument and the observed volume. Which means if you have a space-based LIDAR or um, a surface-based LIDAR, if you look at the attenuated backscatter of the very same volume, they can be quite different because the attenuation uh, between the instrument and the observed volume is very different. But nevertheless, it is um, a physical quantity that can be uh, interpreted also numerically. In order to produce the attenuated backscatter coefficient, we use two different calibration methods. On one hand, it's the, what we call the molecular calibration, um, where we actually um, look for a reference value in the atmosphere, and that's typically where we have no aerosols. If we have no aerosols present, we can calculate the backscatter coefficient uh, from the density, from the air density. And if we have a good estimate of the two-way transmission, then we can figure out the calibration uh, constant or the calibration coefficient of the instrument. So this is this approach is described here in the paper by uh, Wigner and Geis. On the other, so this here is, um, this method here can be used for automatic LIDARs and for high signal to noise oscillometers. 
But for the low signal to noise oscillometers, this method does not work because they are too weak to detect the molecular signal. And that's why this method does not work. And here we have another method that we use, which we call the liquid cloud calibration. And that's based on a publication by Ewan O'Connor in 2004, um, where you can actually find the relationship between the calibration coefficient and the integral of the backscatter profile of the range corrected uh, profile uh, between the cloud base and the point of full attenuation. So in order for this calibration here to work properly, we need a cloud that is uh, a pure liquid cloud and it needs to be dense enough to attenuate the signal completely. So this calibration um, both calibration methods uh, are actually applied every night. So every night for every instrument in the network, we try to perform a calibration and to produce a calibration coefficient. However, only once per month, we actually update the calibration coefficient in the processing chain. And here you see a, um, a plot showing for um, a series of instruments. So this is mainly the, the German network of high signal to noise oscillometers, um, the calibration coefficients that we produce during one month. And then you see the, the median and the scatter around the median. So these calibration coefficients, they are in the same in the same range that is expected because it's the same instrument type and um, we then take the median for each instrument the monthly median and update the processing chain with this value once once per month um, we made some effort to validate our calibration and used the uh, early net network, so the European Research LiDAR network that is now a part of Actris. And we picked three sites where we have a early net reference LiDAR working at the same wavelength as one of our oscillometers of e-profiles. So this is Hohenpeisenberg, Potenza and Granada. And we worked at 1064 nanometers. We calibrated the E profile instrument with the um, uh, routine um, calibration method and then compa compared that to the attenuated backscatter from early net that has been produced with the single calculus chain. We were looking at three months of data, well, and extended it actually to, to one year at the end. And um, so that's um, just an illustration how this looks like. You see here a vertical profile of the attenuated backscatter coefficient. In blue, you see the, um, or in light blue, you see the early net value. In orange, you see the E profile value. And then in dark blue, that's the simulated or the calculated molecular um, profile. You can see here that is a relatively good um, agreement and the agreement is less good in the lower part because here we start to have instrumental artifacts originating from what's called the, the optical overlap. So that's um, an issue related to the alignment of the system. <clears throat> we then build pairs between e-profiles and early net and for each profile pair, we calculated the difference and is illustrated here, and then calculated the statistics with these differences. And that's shown here for the three sites. So for Horn, Peisenberg, Potenz, and Granada, you see here the histograms of these differences. And we got very good results in, in Horn, Peisenberg, with a very low bias and also um, a low scatter around the median value. Um, also good results for um, the Potenza site. However, the scatter is a little bit larger here because the oscillometer in Potenza is of a very first generation. So it's a relatively old instrument and we expect it to see actually more noise. 
In Granada, the comparison did not work out um, as good as expected, and this is most likely related to an overlap issue of the silometer in Granada and needs further investigation. Routinely, we compare the attenuated backscatter data from ePROFILE with uh, CAMS, with the CAMS model that produces also attenuated backscatter at 1064 nanometers for a surface-based um, configuration. And we do this in the framework of the monitoring of our network on a monthly basis. And so you can see here on the left-hand side, you see the median bias between of the of e-profile versus uh, the comms model and you can see that actually e-profile has systematically a little bit lower values that comms or comms is a little bit higher uh, and um, here you can see the root mean square error of these uh, of these values uh, and the numbers are shown in uh, per megameter per uh, steradion so this is a means for us to, to monitor the network, but of course we have, we use this data also, for instance, to uh, assess configuration changes in CAMS. And whenever there's a new, um, a new configuration coming out, we are looking very closely and also transmit these results to the colleagues at uh, ECMWF. So now I would like to explain a little bit how you can access these data. So we have on the one side a, a web page or a web application where you can um, visualize the data and browse through the data in an interactive manner. And on the other hand, we have a repository at the, at the CEDA where you can download the, the data in, in numeric format in a NetCDF format and it is um, organized per, per country, actually. And I will just now show a little bit how you can work with this web application. I think that might be interesting for this community here um, to um, actually, if there are aerosol events to, to explore or to look at the vertical distribution of, of aerosols. So if you go to this um, web application, in general, you can choose between a profile view and a plan view. And the profile view gives you these, um, these quick looks that I already have showed now, where you have these time height cross sections and you have uh, visualized the attenuated backscatter coefficient. You can click on it and then uh, the plot gets big. And if you switch to the plan view, uh, then you can choose different parameters, like for instance, the cloud cover or the cloud base and the cloud base, cloud base height. And here on top, that's the current situation uh, over France, UK, Germany um, regarding the cloud base height. So we have mostly very low clouds between 500 and 1000 meter, meters and then towards the east where the cloud base rises a little bit. And if we look at the cloud cover, which is given in octans, that's just a snapshot of Switzerland. Uh, then we have some stations where we have uh, overcast sky and some stations where we have a completely blue sky. And that's because we have currently a strato situation. So the people living in the mountains, they have the best weather ever and the people living in the plateau here, they are all the time uh, underneath the clouds. So, um, and now just um, a case study, how you can use this web application to, um, to track, for instance, or to understand better uh, an aerosol event. And I'm picking here the Saharan dust event from actually early February of this year, which was at least in, in, uh, in Switzerland and surrounding areas, a very, very strong dust event. You can see here pictures um, from, the, from the Swiss pre-Alps. These are actually clear sky if, if, if you want. So there's, it's not cloudy. It's really just um, so opaque 
uh, by the presence of the Saharan dust. So this was very extraordinary. And also the snow uh, took this uh, orange and brownish color from the, from the Saharan dust that deposited. And um, you can then go to the quick looks and look um, how this looks in the in the vertical. So that's the station at Bern in the center of, of Switzerland. And you can see here in this um, uh, orange, yellow and reddish color, there's a very, very intense or very big concentration of Saharan dust. You have also a few clouds here in dark red uh, that you should not mix up with the, with the aerosols, but here that is the presence of, of aerosols. So a very thick layer. And these are just the according the corresponding back trajectories that bring us to the source region of the, of, of the Saharan dust. And you can then manually track this event if you go to the to the web application. Um, so here is just a, a time sequence. Um, here's uh, let's call day one where you have the dust mostly over um, over Spain, and then um, it advances. We have it a more central part, moving further to the east, and then actually um, it's all has been transported to the east and in the central part, we do not have um, high concentrations anymore. So this is where we are currently with this web application. So it's it's really visual inspection of the data. It's, there's no automatic or um, more sophisticated way to, to actually track such systems. And the difficulty is, even for the expert also sometimes to distinguish between clouds and, and aerosols. And that's a major difficulty also if we want to um, automate, for instance, or, or make an, an automated processing of such, um, of such a tracking of an event. OK, and now I would like to look a little bit ahead. So you have understood that the attenuated backscatter coefficient is the primary product of e-profile. Um, this is already quite useful, but uh, it's not enough. There's still a strong requirement to, to produce extinction coefficient and also mass estimates. And this is what we are currently working on. So between 2021 and 2023, we're implementing a new processing chain to uh, to produce extinction coefficient and mass estimates. And this is based on the, on the basic retrieval and on a forward clet retrieval that is applied or that is actually taking advantage of the calibration that we perform. So if you have calibrated profiles, you can run a forward clet as opposed to a backward clet. And the advantage is illustrated here on the right hand side, you see here, extinction coefficient and at 1064 nanometers for the station of Oslo. And on top you have the backward clet and on the bottom you have the forward clet. And the major, the main difference is, is that the backward clet tries to perform a calibration with every single profile, while the forward clet is relying on, on, on one calibration coefficient that has been calculated independently from the clet retrieval. And you can see that thanks to this forward approach, we have much less um, gaps because you don't need to actually perform a calibration at every instance. And also we do not see these outliers here in dark red, which are simply due to the fact that actually a calibration at this instance was not, was not possible and therefore the um, the extinction coefficient um, is not of good is not of good quality, so that's one of the main novelties that we have implemented here, and it's uh, based on the calibration of the of the um, of the good calibration that we can perform across the e-profile network. So that's a bit how this um, works. Here, the main message is that we will have an interactive part and an automated part in the future. The interactive part here requires an expert user 
to actually choose or define the aerosol type that is present and to choose the LIDAR ratio and to feed this into the forward clet retrieval. And then the forward clet retrieval produces the extinction profiles and from there with a mass to extinction uh, efficiency, the mass profiles. So here in this first stage of this new processing chain, we still have a expert user that has to define the aerosol type or at least to monitor the aerosol type and to choose the LIDAR ratio. In a future version, but that's beyond 2023, we wanna automate this part and have a module um, that might be based on Aeronet data, for instance, or early net data from the research LIDARs. Uh, and we will then have an automated module that determines the aerosol type and the LIDAR ratio. So that's <clears throat> how this looks in a little bit a different, um, and a different, a more architectural uh, view. So this development here is done by, by Met Norway and in particular by uh, Augustin Mortier. And the core of this development is this A profiles module, which is doing the, the forward clet and also applies the uh, mass to extinction efficiency. Um, so A profiles is already uh, on, on GitHub. I'm not sure if it's uh, actually already accessible uh, currently under Augustin's personal account, but this will then later on be moved to a, to a public account. Okay, and with this, I would like to, to conclude. So ePROFILE coordinates three different networks, one dedicated to, to upper air winds, the other one to aerosols and clouds, and the third one to temperature and humidity. Uh, for the aerosol and cloud network, the attenuated backscatter is the operational product as of today. Uh, we perform extensive quality control and monitoring, including all minus B statistics using COMS to ensure a good quality of the data. And we operate a web application that facilitates quite easy data mining and data exploring and the data can be accessed from the CEDA archive. And we are currently implementing a new processing chain to produce also extinction coefficient uh, as well as mass estimates. And with this, I would like to uh, conclude and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you very much again. Thanks a lot, Alexander, for the nice talk. You were super on time. Then thanks, double thanks for that, because it's Friday and I understand that the people maybe want to leave the office sooner. And we will start to do some changes in the way that the people can launch the questions, because it was a request from the audience to have more interaction with the participants. And instead to launch all the questions, if the question is, is marked with a name, we will allow to this person to ask you directly his or her question. Then the first person that we have is Santiago Vaso, that is a well-known participant, and then we will promote him as a panelist. Then he can launch the question directly to you. And if there is some a live discussion, is, is something that we will welcome today as a new thing of the format of the webinar. Uh, okay, can you, I don't see myself, but uh, use me. Okay, yeah. I, I just updated the operating system, my laptop, so everything is new here. We can so see. Hello, here from America. Uh, yeah, uh, I have a just a question is based on one of the slides. Uh, it's, I mean, maybe you already answered this along the way, but I just want to make clear. You showed a comparison of the LIDAR, the high, the high and low signal, uh, signal to noise ratio uh, uh, accelerometers. And it was clear between the LIDAR and the high SNR, SNR uh, accelerometer the, that they didn't 
I mean, they did capture the features, but the, quantitatively, the backscatterings were not quite the same. I mean, it seemed like the LIDAR was missing uh, in quantity. So the point is that, I'm sorry, the silometer wasn't picking up. So the question is, is silometer good enough to replace the LIDAR, at least in quantitative estimates? No, clearly not. And uh, it's good that you ask this question because the silometer is complementary to the research LIDAR. So it's really important um, to understand that for, for the quantitative estimates, you should, whenever possible, rely on the, on the research LIDAR. But the silometer is a, a means to, to, fill, to fill the gaps in time and in space. And the quantitative information is not as good as the one from the research LIDAR or the high SNR LIDAR, but it still has an added value. Um, and especially if you know the uncertainty of, the, of, of your retrieval, I, I believe it's still, it's still beneficial. But it's really not, um, I'm not saying that you could replace a research LIDAR or uh, just a, a high signal to noise uh, LIDAR with a silometer. The silometer will always be inferior in that sense, but the silometer is 24 seven um, and is much cheaper. So that's why the network is much denser. And that's why it is a very good complement to the research LIDAR. So I think for the industry community, for you, what could be most interesting is to combine early net where you have few instruments, but very good data quality and also more information because they have depolarization, they have Raman channels and the profile to actually look at, um, at um, variability in, in space and time of the, of the aerosol layers. Okay, oh, very good. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Santiago. If you want to stay with us, you are welcome. Then the, the next person that is is asking you something is uh, Michael Schulz that is here. And now, Michael, just one minute because I will promote you as a panelist. Also. He is joining us then he can he can ask directly to you i i hope that will be he with us in theory is panelist okay. yeah thanks for the promotion um this comes comparison what i didn't get it was it a surface level uh back attenuate backscatter comparison no it's integrated over the um over the vertical profile okay I don't have in mind which which altitude range, but I, I assume it must be between one and five kilometers. So it's the average. It's 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 the yeah it's the median or the the root mean square over over time and over the vertical axis. Okay. You see, it's like um well if you, if you have five points yeah. vertically. <clears throat> You take the median over these, over these five points. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Thanks. It was a big question. Then, Estelius, we have another one that is an anonymous attendee. I don't know if this person wants to raise a hand and then we can give voice, or if this person prefers that we launch the question. I can. We can read it anyway. Uh, he was asked if we can get information about flight cloud specific type, such as Cirrus or others, uh, or the cloud thickness. Yeah. <clears throat> so for the for the cloud type, you do not get this information directly from the from the silometer. Obviously, you can infer it if the cloud is you know according to the altitude of the cloud, for instance. But for lower clouds, where you can have um, very often have mixed clouds, water and, and ice. Um, it, is, it is not so easily possible, but there's a publication from um, colleagues of, from FMI, from the Finnish Meteorological Institute, and they looked into a cloud classification with the silometer. Um, I do not have the reference 
at hand that I'm, and I don't want to start now to to search, but I can I can provide this afterwards, maybe in the chat or or I send it to Sarah. There's um there's a possibility. Um, so there's research going on to derive is especially to identify liquid clouds uh, or and to distinguish them from mixed or pure ice clouds. And then the cloud thickness that's only possible if it's an um, optically thin cloud. Um, because if the cloud is optically thick, the signal is completely absorbed or attenuated, better, better say attenuated in the cloud, and you do not reach the cloud top. So for some cirrus clouds, for instance, that are optically thin, you can actually um, see the cloud top. But typically a stratos cloud you cannot, uh, you do not penetrate the cloud layer and you do not see the cloud top. Then we have a question from Santiago again because he's raising the hand. Yes, I, I like to talk, like you say, yeah. Uh, so no, this is maybe, I mean, I'm a satellite person. So maybe this is a common uh, way of doing things in the LiDAR community, but you know, with you, when you get a satellite picture over a given area, you get aerosol optical depths. And, uh, you know, it's always a challenge to get uh, PM 2.5 or some PM from optical aerosol optical depth measurements. But if, you, if that image is collocated with a silometer and, and the silometer, I mean, I can think of two scenarios. There's clear sky or, or you know, partially cloudy sky. In the partially cloudy sky, you, the satellite image will give you optical, the aerosol optical depths in the clear sky patches, but the silometer will give you where the cloud base is located. So is, has anybody or has, are there any related studies uh, using the silometer cloud base estimate of the boundary layer thickness and using the aerosol optical depth from satellite to get PM? I mean, it seems like an obvious application, but maybe already did somebody already did it. To my knowledge, not. But yeah, it's oh, an interesting okay. idea. Copyright yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, but anyways, I mean, it sounds like you know, like you know, you you download the satellite picture, you get the AOD, you get the boundary boundary thickness of the kilometer quickly, and you get a quick estimate of PM rapidly. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, it's. Um, yeah. Anyways, it's no, a good just, idea, just, yeah. just just throw in a the, the idea there. Yeah. yeah. What what I can add here is that we are working quite intensively on the on the calculation of the boundary layer height. I mean, you already mentioned it, so that's something you can do with silometers. Uh, if you have these back scatter profiles available, you can uh, identify the top of the of the boundary layer. Yeah. However. Also, there it's not it's not so easy, especially if you have uh, if you have other aerosols present, like advection or clouds or or, or other situation. If it's not a, a convective situation, the silometer also has a hard time to actually determine the boundary layer height. But um, in general, it, it works quite quite well, in particular under convective situations, uh, and then it could definitely be a, a good idea to combine it with the with the satellite. And what we certainly will have to do is once we we are ready with the extinction profiles, um, we can then compare uh, aer the, the aerosol optical depth uh, from the silometer with with other instruments like from Aeronet or also from from satellite retrievals, and that's certainly something we'll have to do. Yeah, I, I guess your, it depends on your degree of how much. And uncertainty you're willing to include, you know? I mean, I, what I'm thinking is just the basic, you know, you assume the aerosol is properly mixed through the boundary layer, so that thickness you'd retrieve it. But yeah. then you can get fancier, you know? You, they could be mixing, they could be, you know, mm -hmm. uh, relative humidity yeah. profiles and things like that, yeah. Okay, cool. Well, well, uh, and what's being done is like, people derive PM10 directly from the silometer also. But also here, um, I just want to stress that there are a lot of assumptions involved 
because the silometer gives you just a very, very basic information. And then you have to make assumptions on the type of aerosol and uh, like its, its size distribution, uh, its, its mixture, uh, and, and these assumptions determine or drive quite clearly your, your result, like um, extinction or also mass concentration. So it's, it's important to, to stress that. This will also yeah. be the case for our new extinction product. It will, it, there are important assumptions going into this retrieval. Okay, yeah, I agree. I'm going to promote another person in the panelist, that is Franco Marenko, that he wants to add something to this discussion. And then Michael raise a hand and he will be the next uh, to do. Franco, you're here. You should, you should be here with us. No? He's coming, he's coming, wait. Sorry. Uh, I didn't realize I was going to come unmuted. Can you hear me? Yeah. So, no, it was just a question to Santiago. Um, the, the idea is uh, to have an optical depth measurements from space, but, and to combine it with the measurement of the boundary layer from the silometer in a cloudy scene, if I understand. And my my idea is that the probably the satellite would observe the aerosols above the cloud and not under the cloud. The silometer would give you the boundary layer height, and I don't know how you would combine the two because you don't have the optical depth in the boundary layer. No, I'm thinking of the scenes. Just think of think of fair weather clouds, you know, partially cloudy scenes where you, where the silometer will see clear sky and and cloudy. But the, the satellite will only give you the clear the optical depths in the clear sky pockets. So it's uh, so that's why it's it's a it's a combined it's a, think of the fair weather clouds in the summer. You know you have, yeah yeah I see what you mean. Yeah. Uh, you yeah you need a, a high resolution in the satellite then to resolve those clouds probably. Yeah, I mean you know that they're they're coming. You know you're starting to see things like that so. You know, and I mean, you, you can play even even with Modis or Veers, you can play games with that. I mean, yeah. Thanks a lot. No worries, Santiago, everything is recorded. Then you can ask for the copyright of the idea, whatever you need. <laughs> it's on record, yeah. <laughs> then uh, Michael, it's, it's your turn if you want to. Yeah, to postpone uh, the evening. Um, just one question. Uh, thanks, uh, Alexander, for a nice presentation. The, how many sites are there where you have sun photometer or early net LIDAR side by side with the accelerometer uh, for calibration? How many are there in Europe? I don't know from the top of my head. Wouldn't it be nice um, to have a list? Maybe we should have a list on that. Yeah, I think we are um, already identified that task to make a list with this um, in view of the validation that we'll have to do yeah. for, for the extinction. Yes. It's surely more but than early... yeah. yeah, yes, yes, but there are, there are a lot of constraints because um, you want a silometer that is not, that is not too old. Mm. That might be one thing. And um, it's not so easy to have. Uh, it needs to write the, the, the right wavelength also, and um, you need like a uh, yeah a good number of of correlating profiles. And early net is operating much much less. You know they do typically yeah, two nights two nights per per week. And sun photometers is also useful, right? Yes, integral. So yeah not for the study or the results I've shown with the attenuated backscatter. I think the sound photometer doesn't yeah. add much there, but now that we are making the step to extinction, the sound photometer is immediately a, like a, a reference measurement for, for our retrievals clearly. And Augusta is certainly aware of that. We have another participant that uh, 
is asking or, or just emphasizing one activity that is ongoing is being sanguidad and now is promote to panelist. Is uh, he's joining us? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, just uh, yeah, thank you for all the work uh, which has been done uh, within the eProfile network for the aerosol clouds uh, uh, properties and for aerosols. We have been working hard on assimilating the milliliters from the French ones from the network, but we are we are still working uh, on that for the kilometers uh, being assimilated in, in our city. I mean, Mokaj, so. Uh, uh, thanks a lot for the data, and uh, we try to have more models assimilating those data. Thank you. Yeah, no, that's uh, that's great, uh, Vincent, and I'm very excited about uh, about this activity at Meteo France. I, I uh, learned about it recently at the profile meeting that you are already very advanced with with the assimilation of lidars, and uh, we're very happy also to, you know, to assist you if you have questions regarding the quality or artifacts that you might that you might see so um but yeah good Thank luck you. with this activity and um this is a very nice uh, use of the data thank you and now is our last person that is greg schuster greg i think that you can talk you are allowed to talk uh, no where you are greg greg can you can hear me good good uh very nice talk i just yeah i had a question about this slide 28 because it's very similar to what we do with calypso have been doing with calypso is trying to come up with optical models so that we can get these extinction profiles and we're, we're kind of making a push now to do a new method for version 5 release and I was just wondering if you all had gone down any path uh, or any ideas that uh, of how you're going to develop these optical models. Yeah. Um, nice to meet you, Greg. And it's um, I think we should we should definitely work together there. I think we can learn a lot from from what you do um, with with Calypso. And I'm unfortunately I can't give you actually any details of this of this module. We were we are still focusing on on this part here where we assume we have the expert, um, but still I would like to refer you to Augustin Mortier, who is uh, who is developing this module and he he might give you he might be able to give you uh, more details. I can put you in contact afterwards if you if you like. Um, oh, but it's better sure. it's better to get the information from him. I've got to run pretty quickly after this, but I think your email was in the invite and I'll probably contact you next year because this year is pretty much wiped out for me. Yeah, well, that, that'd be great. Yeah, and um, I'd definitely also be very interested to learn about uh, the approach you've chosen for, for Calypso. Okay, well, thanks. That was a very nice talk. I really appreciated it. Well, thank you. Great. Okay. Hey, uh... Thank you, Alexander. I think our time is uh, is uh, finishing. And uh, thank you very much for the very interesting talk. And uh, Sarah has to some uh, few slides to show before closing. Yeah, uh, there are a couple of people that wants to raise some questions to you. Oops, sorry. But unfortunately, we don't have time and. Uh, we will pass all your questions to Alexander. Just I want to remind you that the webinars are recorded and available after a few days in this website, that is the Cost in Das website, but also it will be in this WMO San Andalusian Warming Advisor and Assessment System Regional Center, that is this sdswos.imet.es. And also the registration is, is, a, uh, is available through this website then you, you have to go to events for the registration and then see the next, the upcoming events. And then in webinars here in the media room, you will find all the webinars that we did the last year. And all of them were, were very interesting. Then I want to invite you for visit this section. It will be the, the one from Alexander, of course. And I want to announce the next webinar that it will be 19th January next year. It will be the first of the year. 
and our invited speaker is Michael Schultz. You you saw him today in the panelist, and he will uh, he will overview this Irocom inter inter aerosol model intercomparison that is Irocom, and the la the most important results and last activities of this nice initiative that is well connected with the DAS community. And a last uh, announcement is that yesterday we launched one of the most nicer uh, dissemination materials that we produced in, in during this year. And it is available also in the Cost in Das website and you can enjoy. It's a nice video about the impacts of sun and dust storms. And in fact, it's coming from a real book that we, oops, that we uh, we did during the pandemic, basically. Then just enjoy, and if you have kids, you can share with them. And uh, is is something coming in the next year related to this book also? Then keep posted to all the news through the Twitter of the Barcelona Dust on the web, and you can share with all your networks and collaborators because it's open and it's public and it's something that we want to share with all of you. And remember, there are warnings and there are twitters and everything is thanks to the support of this cost association cost that cost in dust. And final but not the less important. Thank you, dear participants. I'm Barbara Kestians, an interim director in DG Research and Innovation. In the absence of Oops, Arena, sorry, North, sorry. Welcome you. It was it was the, the next video. And just I want to Merry, Merry Christmas, wish you a best, the best Christmas that you can uh, enjoy these days. And then hope to see you next year in 2022 with a better situation. And we can forget a little bit more the pandemic and the corona. Then just keep in touch and follow through our social networks and web. Thanks a lot, Alexander, again, for accepting our last minute invitation. It was really nice talk. Thank, Thank you very much. Please. Thanks, Ernest. Bye -bye. And uh, just remember, the registration for the Michael's webinar is open. Then you can, you can access and then do the registration before you forget it. Hope to see you in the next webinar. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank bye. you very bye. much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Adiós. Hasta siempre.